So I was going to talk to you about um, football, but uh, Twak says we should talk about something to do with cataracts. Thì ông nói vui thôi là ông định là nói cho mình nghe về bóng đá, nhưng mà ông lại đổ thừa tôi lần khi ông nói về cataract, tức là nói giỡn thôi. So we're going to talk about cataract surgery in difficult eyes. Và chúng ta sẽ nói về những cái trường hợp khó khi mà phẫu thuật pha cô. And these are the objectives, really to appreciate that planning is needed for managing complex cases. Thì đây là cái mục tiêu thì học xong cái bài này thì mình sẽ cần biết là những cái kế hoạch mình cần đặt ra để mà xử lý những cái trường hợp phức tạp. And then we'll show a number of complex cases and really to um, make the point that complexity is just simplicity multiplied. You can break it down into lots of simple steps. Thì ông sẽ cho mình xem nhiều cái tình huống mà nó phức tạp và ông muốn nhấn mạnh là cái những cái sự phức tạp này thật ra nó chỉ là những cái sự đơn giản mà nó có gồm nhiều bước. And then just to demonstrate that you need to be adaptable to cope with uh, more complex cases. Và cái quan trọng nữa là mình cần phải thích nghi, thích ứng với cái hoàn cảnh Now these are your multiple choice questions and they may not seem relevant at the moment. Thì đây là cái câu hỏi trước uh, 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 cái bài giảng, đây là multiple tức là câu hỏi nhiều lựa chọn. First one is what advantages can data capture give when performing surgery? Thì câu hỏi đầu tiên đó là uh, những cái mà lợi ích uh, khi mà mà mình uh, dựa vào cái số liệu á trước mổ Second one is, uh, I want you to suggest two strategies for shallow anterior chambers in cataract surgery. Và uh, có thể có hai cái uh, cái uh, cái chiến lược hoặc là hai cái uh, cái giải pháp nào mà mình có thể uh, ứng dụng đối với những trường hợp mà uh, đục thủy tinh thể mà có tiền phòng nông. The third one you should be able to answer now. What agent should be used to identify vitreous in a complex case? Và câu hỏi thứ ba đó là mình có thể dùng những cái uh, chất nhầy nào để mà sử dụng. À, mình mình có thể dùng những cái chất nào để mà phát hiện cái uh, thị cái cái um, dịch kính trong những trường hợp mà phức tạp. Anybody know? Thì ở đây có ai biết không ạ? À? Yeah. Well done. You passed. Okay, so the first thing is we're going to talk about how you can prevent or anticipate complications. Thì cái điều đầu tiên đó là mình làm sao mình có thể mà uh, phòng ngừa hoặc là mình tiên đoán được cái việc mà xảy ra biến chứng. And this uh, slide just shows the cataract surgery rate in the UK from 1963 to 2003. And there are two interesting things to note. The first is that I started ophthalmology in 1983. I started training in ophthalmology in 1983. I know I look too young. And um, the other thing to notice is that I became a consultant in 1990. Và năm 1990 thì ông trở thành một cái and look what happened to the cataract rate after that. So it's the commonest operation we do in the National Health Service in the UK. It's the commonest operation performed in the United Kingdom. So it's about four and a half percent of all operations performed in the UK. Local anesthetic in 95 percent. And fake emulsification in 99.7 percent. Và trong đó thì phẫu thuật mình nhũ tương hóa thủy tinh thể là chiếm 99.7 and where we differ from most of the world is that trainees performed one third of all cataract operations in the UK. And we do about 400,000 a year. 
400 ngàn ca Ở gì ạ? Now we, some cataract units in the UK collect post-operative data in an electronic patient record. And um, a professor called John Sparrow has analyzed the data from 55,000 cataracts. And he analyzed the complications, which are all these. So posterior capsule rupture, um, iris trauma, there are a whole range of complications he analyzed and what percentage of cases they occurred in. So you can see that vitreous loss, posterior capsule rupture, vitreous loss, 1.92%. Uh, so that's one in 50 of every cataract that's performed. So what he then did, he identified the causes of those complications. He identified what caused the complications. And these were the causes of the complications of posterior capsule rupture vitreous loss. And so if the patient is unable to lie flat, there's an adjusted odds ratio of 1.27. It's 1.27 times more likely you'll lose vitreous if the patient can't lie flat. And if, you're, if the patient is male, it's a little more likely. Males have a lot to put up with. And right at the bottom of the list, trainee surgeons, 3.73 times as likely to lose vitreous. And you would expect that. Now, what Professor Sparrow worked out is that if you multiply all the odds ratios together for a particular patient, you can work out a probability of that particular complication. So, for example, female patient, 90 years old, consultant surgeon doing the operation, you multiply all those risk factors together and the predicted probability of vitreous loss is 1.7%. But what if it's a male patient, 90 years old, pseudo exfoliation, glaucoma, white cataract, no view of the fundus, small pupil, and they can't lie flat, then the odds ratio is 44%. Thì ông nói là nếu như mà một bệnh nhân mà có rất là nhiều yếu tố nguy cơ như là ví dụ bệnh nhân nam giới mà 
trên 90 tuổi nè, có đồng tử nhỏ nè, mà mình không có uh, thấy được cái ảnh đồng tử và bệnh nhân không thể mà nằm mà bản được thì cái nguy cơ mà bệnh nhân bị uh, đắt bao sau là lên tới 44%. So this patient is almost as likely to lose vitreous as not. So, I showed you this form recently. These are the scores that we use for those adjusted odds ratios. And we can now risk stratify the patients. So hopefully, if we give the difficult cases to the more experienced surgeons, we'll have a lower risk, a lower rate of posterior capsule rupture. So some complex cases. Now, here's a small pupil. Who would operate on this patient? Nobody? One, okay. Good. And there are things you can do to make it easier. So uh, there are some, you could put a Malugin ring in. This is the ring designed by Boris Malugin. And suddenly the operation is much easier. You can use iris hooks. There are a number of ways of reducing the risk. Um, and a small pupil is a definite risk. So if you can make the pupil bigger, the risk goes down. Then we talked um, yesterday, I think, about the side port, and that 65% of all the fluid you use comes out of the side port, where the second instrument is. You can see all the fluid escaping from here. And it, it can sometimes get in the way of the view, so if you just take it out, it makes things a lot clearer. It gets in the way of the surgery, all the water. So just take the second instrument out and it makes things much easier. You'll see in a moment, I think the instrument comes out and then all the water disappears. So if the view is difficult, just take the instrument out, do some more surgery and only put the instrument back in when you need it. Now remember that if the patient can't lie flat, that's an additional risk. This gentleman it was quite difficult. So sometimes you have to stand up. You've got to make it comfortable to operate. This is difficult because you have to do the FACO. And then if you want to focus the microscope, you change feet. And then the FACO again. So it's a bit tiring, but it makes it much easier than trying to sit down. This is a, a useful trick uh, to do called the Chioni maneuver. What you'll see as the as the phaco probe goes into the eye, the anterior chamber goes very deep suddenly. 
khi mà mình đưa à, cái đầu pha vô vào trong thiền really thì cái thiền phòng nó sẽ sâu ra And that's due to, uh, sorry, go on. So that makes it quite difficult to reach the cataract. You can't reach, you can't get to the cataract. And this is due to reverse pupil block. Reverse pupil block. So you. So you have to break the pupil block. And you do that by putting an instrument under the iris and just lifting it forwards. So watch. Under the iris and lift it forward and the whole chamber will shallow again. And that makes the faker much easier. But each time, each time you put the faker into the eye, it will happen again. So you have to do it each time. So here are some examples of difficult cases. This is a very shallow anterior chamber. The corneal wound is a little too close to the limbus. So the easiest place for the fluid to escape is under the iris and it will push the iris out of the eye. And you'll see it's starting to happen already. Starting to come out and um, So once you see this happening, it's really important to stop and sort it out. And sometimes it's very difficult because the wound is just made in the wrong place. So you can close the wound, put a stitch in, and make another wound. And the big problem arises when you inject fluid. When you're starting to do the hydro dissection, the iris will come straight out again. Because that's the pathway of least resistance. The pathway of least resistance. The fluid will find the easiest path out of the eye. Once it's happened, the pupil sphincter is damaged, and that means the iris is very floppy. So again, it's important to deal with it. You know, you can do a little iridectomy, iridotomy, to let the fluid out through there. Uh, or you can close the wound and put a stitch in and make a fresh wound. But the easiest solution is to do the capsulorexis through a side port with a needle. And then this is uh, just to show uh, when the eye becomes suddenly hard during surgery. Have you ever seen that? When it becomes suddenly hard. Yes.
And if this happens during surgery, there are six causes. Two of them are outside the eye, so retrobulbar hemorrhage is one possible cause, or a very tight speculum. The speculum is too tight and it's pressing on the eye. And the causes that occur inside the eye, the most common one is what I just showed you with if you uh, put fluid in the eye, it can go through the zonules and hydrate the vitreous and then you get a pressure in the eye and the iris pops out like this. So the eye goes suddenly hard, the iris comes out and usually it's when you've injected fluid. And if you wait 20 minutes, it will get better. And another cause is a suprachoroidal hemorrhage. But that usually occurs once the phaco is finished because the eye is soft. And when the eye collapses, when it's soft, the long posterior ciliary arteries will break sometimes and bleed. So it's important to try and assess uh, which of these causes is, is uh, causing the problem. And if you press the eye and it's moving backwards, it's not an orbital problem. If the eye moves backwards, it's not the orbit causing the problem, so no hemorrhage. There's the speculum causing the problem. And if you just change the speculum, it all gets better. So you remove the speculum, replace it with an adjustable one. Now, this is a, a case where you can see that the, the cataract is out, the iris has come out, and the eye has gone very hard. So your first thought should be, at this stage, this may be a suprachoroidal hemorrhage. And you can see the viscoelastic, uh, the surgeon is trying to deepen the AC, but the viscoelastic is coming straight out because the pressure inside the eye is very high. So in that case, uh, the best course of action is just to stop. Again, this surgeon is uh, trying to inflate the AC, but it's very hard. Inflate, um, yeah, deepen the AC, deepen the AC. And if it's due to aqueous misdirection or fluid in the eye, then it will get softer and you can put the iris back. So this is a case of what's called capsular distension. There's fluid in the capsule causing a shallow AC and if you press the lens backwards, the fluid comes out and the AC will deepen. Dis distension. Distension, it means uh, inflating the bag. Distension syndrome.
ông nói là cái này là cái hội chứng thì thực ra cái hội chứng này là do khi mà mình lùa cái dịch nó sẽ cái mũi tao mình bị tắt không mà dịch nó lùa ra phía mặt sau cái t ba nó đẩy cái cái t ba đi ra trước nó nghẹn không tử chứ là có cái khoảng dịch nằm giữa cái t ba là cái bao sâu không có khoan ảo cái thứ dịch nó đó giữa cái bao sâu với cái cái thủy thủy thì mình chưa lấy ra để làm cách nào đó để mình ép mình đẩy cái lượng dịch nó ra thì cái tiền phòng nó mới sâu lại được cái hội chứng nghẹn cái bao So the main cause is outside the eye, retrobulbar hemorrhage, speculum. The main cause is inside the eye, expulsive hemorrhage and capsula block. Okay. Now this is a case of um, a patient who had cataract surgery uh, and had a um, retrobulbar, sorry, a, a supracroidal hemorrhage and the surgery was stopped immediately and this is one week later. And it's safe to complete the surgery once the hemorrhage has stopped a week later. Okay. So this is another type of case. This is post-trauma and this is an iridodialysis. And it's important to move the iris out of the way before you do the cataract. So the iris is uh, moved into position with viscoelastic, and then the iris root is sutured back with proline sutures. That was real time surgery. Real time, no, not really. So once the iris is sutured back, you've got space to remove the cataract. And and put an implant in and uh, at the end it all looks reasonable. So this is tenoproline suture used for the peripheral iris. Tenoproline, ten zero proline. And you can see some of the iris root has not been sutured, so that acts as an iridotomy or an iridectomy and lets aqueous through. So you can see that even if, if you look at this case at the beginning, it looks very complicated. Each step is very simple. Uh, in this traumatic cataract, the uh, the eye has been sewn sewn up with teno nylon, and you can see. The positive CDL test it's still leaking. In this case, the cataract, uh, the the, cap the lens capsule has been broken, and the cataract has fluffed up. And uh, the cataract is very soft, so it just aspirates out with a Simcoe cannula. You can use Vision Blue at any stage to stay in the capsule. Uh, 
And now you can see the capsular rexis being performed. Again, everything uh, just done very slowly and very carefully, trying to maximize your vision. And then the cataract comes out by aspiration. And at the end, uh, lens goes in. And the corneal suture is replaced to try and stop the leak. And at the end, it's not leaking, so it looks much better. These patients can do really well with a contact lens because they have a fairly central scar, the vision can be poor. When you put a contact lens over that, they can improve to very good vision because the contact lens gives them a very regular surface and they can overcome the effect of the, of the scar and the astigmatism caused by the trauma. Now, who's heard of Ozidex? Anyone heard of Ozidex? This is a steroid, and this is what it looks like but you don't usually put it in the lens of the eye. It's not a good place for it. It usually goes in the vitreous cavity. This was one of our trainees whose hand slipped when he injected it, and it went straight into the middle of the lens. And uh, the woman complained that her vision got worse. And strangely, if you look in the textbooks, it doesn't tell you how to remove an Ozidex cataract. So you have to make it up. And essentially, we just did a FACO. I put an iris hook here because uh, that's where the Ozidex went in. And I thought it might have damaged the zonules. The zonules. I thought it might have damaged the zonule because that's where the injection went in. And in fact, it came out quite easily. But the patient needed Ozidex, and, and it's expensive. So when we finish the cataract, we put the lens in, and then we do the primary posterior rexis. And then I put the Ozidex back into the back of the eye where it should have been. So these implants cost several hundred pounds each. Several, several hundred pounds. I don't know how many, four or five hundred pounds. And although it looks not very different at the end, it did actually sink into the vitreous cavity and she got, uh, it was for a vein occlusion, she got much better.
chân này là có cái cái hiện tăng nó nằm ở phía sau và cái 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 thì lực của mình cải thiện okay So we talked about uh, trimcinolone yesterday. I'm not going to talk too much about that, but if you suspect uh, that there's vitreous in the eye, always use trimcinolone. And I showed you this yesterday. You'll remember the effect of trimcinolone on vitreous. So just a little bit about short eyes. If you have a hypermetropic eye, uh, there are one or two tricks that make it easier to do the surgery. The first is that when you make the wound, the corneal wound, you keep away from the limbus, move forward into the cornea, and make it a little bit longer. <laughs> Quite short, but a little bit longer than usual. And the capsular rexis should be done through a side port with a needle. This is just to show a diagram. Uh, it's not very clear, but uh, if you put your wounds near to the iris root, you, the iris will come out, as I showed you before. If you put the wound a little more into the cornea and keep it a bit longer, then that protects the iris from coming out. And the other trick is you can bend your own needle. Instead of using a preformed sister tome, you can bend your own needle. And uh, it's important to bend the tip at 45 degrees and then the shaft at 45 degrees. And that gives you. So here's an example of a shallow chamber. So you can deepen the chamber with viscoelastic. And then bend the needle tip at 45 degrees and the shaft at 45 degrees. Make sure the needle is on viscoelastic. Put uh, the needle onto the viscoelastic. And then the chamber will usually stay deep. And you usually do this before you do the main wound. This wound is too near to the limbus. Sorry. So, which bit? Say again. Go on, we can. So this is just showing again in the shallow chamber the risk of the iris coming out if the wound is too near the limbus. There it goes again. Bless you. So again, here's the side port being used to do the capsulotomy, and you do this before you open the eye with the main wound. Okay. 
And then you can open the eye and just keep the wound a little more corneal. Yeah, this one was finished with the forceps. These cross action forceps are very nice too. They work this way. And then, and then just a word about nanophthalmos. So this is a case where the eye is less than nine millimeters corneal diameter. And these cause major problems. They have a very thick sclera. They get choroidal detachments and effusions, suprachoroidal hemorrhages, shallow ACs, uh, and they may need a posterior vitrectomy to decompress the eye. They're very difficult eyes. The implant is likely to be about 60 diopters, uh, and you can buy 60 diopter implants. Some people use two lenses, but there's not usually room for that. And the biometry is usually very inaccurate, so they often end up, end up much less long-sighted than the reading suggests. So it's best to undercorrect them and then do the final correction with glasses or contact lenses. And post-operatively they can get severe iritis, choroidal effusions, aqueous misdirection, and they need careful post-op monitoring. So here's an example of a post-operative nanophthalmic eye and a tiny cornea, very thick sclera, um, and lots of problems during the surgery. They're very difficult eyes to operate on. And this is 18 months later. You can see the corneal failure now. Um, this lady's had a vitrectomy as well for her aqueous misdirection. Uh, and her other eye was completely blind. She lost the other eye from an operation about 30 or 40 years ago. So they're really difficult eyes. You need a very senior surgeon with experience to do them. So in summary, it's really important to plan these cases carefully, the, the difficult cases. Um, for the shallow ACs, keep the wound a bit shorter, but move it into the cornea more. Uh, use the needle through the side port for the rectus. Um, and this risk scoring is really important. Try and give appropriate cases to appropriate surgeons. <coughs>
Okay, so what advantages can data capture give you when performing surgery? Anybody? Capturing data, data capture, information. So this is data about complications, about lenses that go in, all the data that we put in. Um, and it's really to make the point that uh, if you can start to capture information about complications, then you can start to risk stratify, as I showed you at the beginning. So the main advantage of capturing data and analyzing it is you can analyze problems and deal with them. Two strategies for shallow chambers. Are you giving them the answers? Are you giving them the answers? Are you giving the answers away to the questions? Are you sure? So two two things you can do for a shallow chamber. Needle through the side port. Make the incision away from the limbus. Good. Thank you.